Thank you, Matt. Well, as an update on what I mentioned about space travel last week, uh, William Shatner, also known as Captain Kirk, launched into space. I mean, last week we were talking about he was going to do this, and sure enough, he did it. And then he did return. You might have seen the um, interviews of him after the space capsule landed as he tearfully told of what he saw and what he learned from space. Any of you, even Captain Kirk fans out there, anybody? Okay, there are a few of you who probably got into his tears and you thought, wow, how moving that Captain Kirk actually did go to space. Well, he was changed. I mean, clearly, he was changed by seeing things from a different perspective, even if only for a few minutes, feeling differently about his place in the universe. I doubt you and I will ever be able to do that from space. I mean, I'm just guessing probably none of us in here are going to fork over a half million dollars to be able to go and do what he did. If you do, be sure to contact me because I want to talk about an offering to the church if, uh, if you're able to do that. But we can, even though we can't go do that, we can see the universe and our places in it without ever going to space. In fact, our texts today help us to find our place in the universe. If you've ever been wondering where you are in the universe or where you're supposed to be, you're in luck because the text today definitely help us to understand that. In our first reading, we hear God's answer to Job's questions as he is in the midst of great suffering, contemplating where he is and even more so where God is in the midst of all of that's going on in his life. God's reply to Job begins with this. He says, Where were you, Job, when I laid the foundations of the earth? And continues with reminders that God is the one who has made the universe that Job lives in. As the creator, as the provider, as the sustainer, of all things. God is aware of Job. He is aware of his sufferings. He's aware of all that's going on around him and his place in the universe. In our second reading, in Hebrews chapter 5, we hear of how Jesus found and took his place in the universe, doing so with an awareness of his calling and his work of sacrificial love. I mean, you can't help but get a feeling for that sacrificial love by reading through Hebrews, but especially in this chapter 5, which the author of Hebrews described as the high priesthood of Jesus. Jesus took His place in the world with humility. And if you look back in the text, uh, the author mentions a reverent submission not just submitting to God, but a reverent and humble submission to God. Even though he suffered for his work, he was obedient to God and became, as the author described him, the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. And then the Gospel text, Mark chapter 10, tells us of how Jesus had to remind his disciples of their place in the universe. And I found this image uh, yesterday that just seems to really wrap up how Jesus must have felt most of the time with the disciples. It's the, if they had emojis back then, it would be the face palm emoji. Like, really? I mean, come on, James and John. We've been talking about this stuff all along. We've been working on this. You have seen me in my leadership position as one who is very humble. And we've been talking about a whole different kind of kingdom. So he had to be very frustrated with them. And he has to remind them of their place in the universe. I mean, they envisioned their personal greatness 
and had the gall to ask Jesus for a place of recognition and power, seeking to find their place at either side of Him when He came into His place of glory. It's like, Jesus, don't forget us. When you get there in that place of glory, don't forget us, especially me and my brother. I mean, the other ten disciples, do with them what you will. But make sure we are on either side of you because we love you the most and we ought to have that place. Well, Jesus told them that they didn't know what they were asking and certainly didn't understand what was involved in joining Him in His place in the universe. And so He told them, whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you must be slave of all. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. Well, I'm pretty sure that wasn't the answer or glory that they were looking for that day. And that leads us to consider that we, as followers of Jesus today, are to know and find our place in the cosmos. Jesus wants us to be very clear about where we belong in this world. And the first way of doing so is with an awareness of our calling. seems like we've talked a lot about our calling lately, uh, maybe because we celebrated our 11th anniversary as a church but also as we thought about it in our own individual lives, about what is it that God has called us to do? Well, just like Jesus, we are to be in tune with what God has put us in this world to be and to do. In fact, our calling as a church is a continuation of His priestly calling. Have you ever thought about it in that sense? We are to continue on with this priestly calling of Jesus. As the body of Christ in the world, we are a priesthood of believers called to share the sacrifice that Jesus made for the world and offering it to everyone, everybody around us, by proclaiming the good news of reconciliation with God. Paul picks up on these words and says that we're all ambassadors for Christ with the message of reconciliation, going around and telling people, hey, get reconciled to God. Church for the Highlands was founded with the understanding that we are to be that kind of church, that we are to be a missional church. In fact, I think the very first study we did as a church was a missional study to uh, prepare for a missional grant that we would get as a church to do some things right here in the neighborhood. But that means that we are a group of people sent, sent into our world, primarily Highland, to share the love of Jesus. And this is our calling. And we must continue to hear it as we gather and as we exist together as a church. But we must also hear it individually as members of the body of Christ, always being aware of how this relates to us and why we are here as a church. We also find our place in the universe by living with humility. So it's not just about our calling to be priests in this world, but to do so with humility. A great definition of humility that comes from Merriam-Webster is this. Freedom from pride or arrogance. The quality or state of being humble. Simple as that. C.S. Lewis defined it this way. Humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. That's a great definition as well, isn't it? As we look at Jesus, we see the perfect picture of humility. Such humility reminds us of our place in the universe as servants. I mean, didn't Jesus give us the perfect model of what it means to live in this world as those who are full of humility? 
we practice humility, when we consider the needs of other people, when we actively listen to people, especially those people who are in our families and in our relationships, when we honor others rather than seeking recognition for ourselves, and when we practice daily thanksgiving as a way of remembering that what we have comes from God, doesn't come from us. I think that's what Jesus wanted James and John to know. It's not about you. It's not about what you're doing or maybe what you're contributing. It's about what God has given to you. And humility is a way of recognizing that every day by giving thanks to God. Living with the humility of Jesus may make us look and feel powerless at times. But we must see that selfless actions are what God uses to change the world for good. What goes with humility is submission. Submitting to God in all things. When we submit ourselves to God, we are finding our place in the universe. I'm convinced of that. Like humility, submission, it just sounds like weakness, doesn't it? As we see Jesus on the cross, we see what looks to us to be weakness. As the Romans looked at Jesus on the cross and others that they would crucify upon crosses, they wanted to make a statement about weakness, saying that we are powerful. We are a powerful empire and you will submit to us. Jesus turns that completely around, doesn't he? And says this is what real power is like. It takes the cruciform of submission to God. And it does go against our grain of self-empowerment and American rugged individualism that we can do it by ourselves. It challenges our desire to be in control of our lives, our dreams, our possessions, our finances, and our destiny. But when we signed up to follow Jesus, and you did sign up to follow Jesus, didn't you? Somewhere along the way, you said, yeah, sign me up. I want to be a follower of Jesus. When you did that, you submitted or surrendered your life to him completely. Isn't that what it means to call Jesus Lord? Submitting to God happens when we give up control to God and God's way of doing things. It's when we allow ourselves to be shaped by God's words, God's ways, and God's plans rather than our own or those from our society or our culture. Isn't this what we hear Jesus doing in our Hebrews text this morning? Going forward with God's will and doing so with reverent submission even when it isn't easy. I'm wondering this morning, in what areas of your life do you need to submit to God today? Think about that. And in what ways does the church submit to the leadership and authority of God? As I mentioned earlier, William Shatner was emotional after getting a new perspective of Earth. He told Chris Como in an interview, I was moved to tears by what I saw, and I come back filled with, overwhelmed by sadness and empathy for this beautiful thing that we call Earth. He was reminded of the importance of finding our place in the universe. As we've learned from our text this morning, it is vital that we too find our place right here in our universe, right here in God's universe. As we continue God's mission of love through Jesus. Let us pray.